Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our talk about clusterless architectures. Uh, this is a new design that's coming out of the virtual cluster space, and it allows you to utilize clusters of clusters uh, seamlessly to run workloads wherever, wherever you need to. Uh, Faye and I uh, will be talking to you about this, and we're both the maintainers for the project along with uh, some other folks. Um, Faye works at Alibaba, and I work at Apple. So, uh, why we're talking about this and why this is important. So one of the things that as you start to use uh, Kubernetes, you start to realize that uh, when you started, you initially started with at least a single cluster and uh, you, you started to build out your architectures and you, and you deployed workloads into that single environment and you started to see some problems. This is something that uh, I feel like everybody experiences in their Kubernetes journey. And so where folks usually go is they turn to a multi-cluster management style. Uh, and the whole idea behind this is it allows you to actually scale out your architecture. So uh, taking from a single cluster, which has scale targets uh, that are defined by SIG, SIG scalability um, and moving that into how do we make it so that we could run, you know, 4X the type of capacity that we currently have and, and being able to do that and scale your workloads horizontally gets somewhat difficult. Uh, on top of that, uh, customers really want to start to look at things like how to, how to deploy and run workloads in specific regions and areas where their data might be located. Um, if you're thinking like bachelor workloads where you're processing a lot of data, you don't want to run that from uh, completely opposite ends of uh, the country, for example. Uh, in this environment, you also get to a place where you're really taking, you're bringing in a lot more compute resources and everything gets more difficult to actually uh, manage and aggregate across those. So what you end up doing is start to look at that, that multi-cluster space and then bring in things like uh, HA, strategies? How would you actually increase the availability of your workloads? How do you set up regions that you can actually fail over into uh, when something goes wrong? Uh, I imagine everybody here has experienced uh, issues with etcd having key space uh, problems and you get a corrupted key and you end up with an entire cluster that just doesn't function anymore. And how do you actually recover for those things? On top of this, we get into an, a new world of how do you actually build out the security compliance when you have now distributed workloads uh, across different environments, uh, as well as the autonomy of those workloads going forward? Now, on top of that, there's an ever-growing space that's really important here to, to acknowledge, which is the hybrid and multi-cloud space. Uh, so workloads that might have been deployed into on-premise data centers are now trying to expand in to get the flexibility that you get out of the multi-cluster world. Uh, and this really brings in a, a, the new aspects and what uh, Faye and I work on most closely is the multi-tenancy space. And so what this actually brings on, brings on a lot of challenges. Uh, as you can see, there's at least five bullets here that, that uh, underneath them have a lot of components uh, that go into them. But there's a lot of tools already in this space that folks have been working on. So things like lifecycle management, how do you actually go and create new clusters? Are you using public cloud tools like EKS and GKE and AK, ACK? Uh, to actually deploy those things? Are you using open source tools like uh, what Faye and I work on with the CAPI space or are you using uh, open container management? Are you using any of the off the shelf vendor tools? Um, going, in, going on top of that, there's then the governance of those. So now that you have distributed uh, workloads across many clusters, how do you do centralized management? How do you make sure that the security policies are set up uh, and they abide by what your security teams within your companies actually need? Uh, and really making sure that they're they're customizable, but they give they're, they're customizable, but they don't expose you to anything uh, too far. On top of that, you have to look into a a vast space here of monitoring and tracing. There are many tools that we have to work with nowadays, um, dashboards to visualize across those clusters, uh, where the data is actually going to live and how that functions. Now. What we're really going to be talking about in this in this talk is the fourth and fifth sections, and I and uh, because there are already tools expanding across those other those other uh, challenges, we really wanted to look into how to make this uh, how to abstract this and how to make it so that you can have better workload management, but still, in essence, give you the same sort of experience we have. Now, the tools that are currently existing uh, and that folks have been using, things like KubeFed and Argo CD, um, they bring on that same level of abstraction, but they kind of give it, they give you some trade-offs in terms of what you're actually going to be doing at a granular level. And then the last thing is scheduling. Now, if you have multiple clusters, you need to figure out how you're going to actually schedule those workloads across them. Is that something manual where everybody knows about every single cluster that is potentially access accessible to them and they go and manually decide 
I want to deploy to this cluster in this region because of this specific thing, uh, or is there an automated system that kind of does those does that work for you? Uh, thinking about things like um, the GitOps world and trying to deploy to some cluster based on some decision in a in a declarative script. So enter in clusterless. Uh, now in a multi-cluster environment, uh, the idea here with clusterless is that we want to achieve really the single cluster user experience. So everything that everybody knows and loves about Kubernetes today, being able to take that and say, what does this look like across many clusters uh, without really introducing new APIs and making it so that every single off the shelf tool that you currently use could potentially be deployed into that same exact experience. You deploy some operator to do maybe Prometheus. How do you make it so that a uh, user using the single cluster experience can deploy that operator and have it naturally translate into a, into a multi-cluster environment. Now, there's some caveats to what we've designed so far and where it is in its current landscape. Um, it doesn't really work as well for, for redundancy for availability of workloads. Um, we, it, it also doesn't uh, suffice exactly today for uh, heterogeneous hardware where you have different SLAs and um, uh, different types of models for the actual hardware that you're running on. But it's really great for when you just have a lot of the exact same worker cluster and you're just trying to run more of what you already have in that single cluster. And realistically, uh, it's trying to, trying to, in essence, minimize the integration cost by truly treating this as just another off-the-shelf Kubernetes deployment. And so... This is where we are. We're going to be talking about the design of how this all, how clusterless functions for us, and then we'll go into the architecture, uh, the implementation, and some of, and at the end we'll summarize kind of what we've all talked about. So cluster abstraction. What's really important here, and what where we started with the project is basically looking at how to take a single cluster or multiple clusters and abstract them into that into that single cluster space. Uh, and what we wanted to do is really introduce no new uh, workload clusters, uh, new workload controllers uh, into those worker clusters. So taking a look at the lowest level abstraction that's in Kubernetes, things like pods, and how would you actually spread that across, work, uh, across those clusters? And this is something that we already are seeing um, other open source tools doing. So TensorCube and uh, Likio are basically doing this already, uh, but they do this using tools like Virtual Kubelet uh, as their abstraction. So they can, they can run a Virtual Kubelet, which then addresses one or many clusters under the hood uh, for actually deploying those workloads. Now, in our world, uh, we started with, with the tool chain that we've been working on most heavily, which is Virtual Cluster, and trying to bring that same level of abstraction um, to that environment. So it's, a, it's something that you already are seeing uh, and we're just extending this into tools that we have today. Now to take an aside for a second, uh, there's, an important, there's an important conversation that we need to have here about uh, the abstraction level that we're talking about. And that's specific to pods versus workloads. So as you look at the, the entire space of this, not just the uh, tensile cube and those kind of workloads, uh, there's other things in here. There's OCM, or yeah, OCM. There's Argo. Uh, there's Karmata. A lot of these tools are doing it at a different abstraction. So they're requiring you to have a specific uh, CRs or custom resources that you actually deploy with that define the entire the entire resource that you're actually deploying. Um, and so you it ends up in a place where you have to do very specific policy based replication of those objects uh, and synchronizing those workloads objects to the downstream clusters that deploy them. Uh, what you can kind of see in there is you end up having controllers running in nest in those worker clusters that operate on those workload objects and make sure that those are scheduled as you'd expect. And uh, where this actually leads you to is not having any pod objects in your user's control plane. So I, as a user, might be using one of those tools and deploying a CR to deploy a full workload, which defines everything, and it goes to a specific cluster and gets scheduled. And so there's the difference between pod and workload granularity there. Um, so things like with pods, you get no new APIs. You get to use the standard off-the-shelf Kubernetes resources that we all know and love and have been using for you know, many years at this standpoint. Um, we're not fragmenting those resources in any, any new ways. Uh, and, we, uh, and we define this at, at a better utilization perspective because it's singularly focused on the, the pod as that unit of Kubernetes to be scheduled. And this kind of breaks down uh, in, in one regard, which is 
if you have uh, if you have a centralized control plane that is the user's control plane that's actually creating those objects, and if something goes wrong with that, and that's now disconnected, uh, and something goes wrong with the pods on those lower level clusters, there's really no orchestration piece that's continuing to orchestrate them or to continue to, to keep them up. Now, from a workload granularity side of things, it does require you to run uh, those extra, extra controllers that go and operate on those, but it gives you the benefit of um, distributed uh, orchestration. So if something goes wrong with the top level user control plane, that uh, underlying CR could continue to run even if something happens. If the cluster has a failure and it comes back up to a healthy state, it can continue to run those workloads. But you get the negatives of having to run those new APIs uh, to, to assist with the actual propagation of the resources. And it's kind of inconvenient to actually uh, debug those workloads because now you have a difference between what's in the what's in the user cluster and what's in the actual workload cluster that's or the worker cluster that's actually running those things. So that brings us into scheduling. So now as you kind of can understand where we're coming from with the architecture, uh, you can you can kind of look at the the many different outlets that we could have had for for building a solution like this. So there's single tier uh, single tier scheduling, and if you're familiar with like the Mesos world, a lot of these concepts will kind of come into play. Uh, basically, if you have single tier scheduling, which very much looks like what the Kubernetes scheduler has, you have all of the nodes allocated to a single scheduler, uh, and it and it will pick and choose where the workloads are going to run along those nodes. Um, this is also uh, this also limits your abilities at the end of the day. Um, a single, a single uh, scheduler is going to have scalability limits for how many pods it can actually handle, how many nodes it can actually handle, because it's gonna have to do checks against all of those nodes in the cluster. And it's gonna have to make sure that all of those, um, every component of the environment is, is up and ready to accept workloads. Now, take a step down, we go into two level scheduling. Uh, and so this is things like TensorCube, which is basically, taking at the top level user cluster and creating a, a first tier scheduler. Again, this is very similar to the Mesa architecture where we're gonna, we're gonna delegate the tasks along so that each thing can do it very well. So the first tier is going to basically go through and pick a, a, in essence, a cluster that the pods could be dispatched to. So where in our entire environment, the many clusters that are all connected to uh, this single, single user facing control plane, where does the workload actually get scheduled? Uh, and then once that once it picks that, it drops it onto those lower level worker clusters to go and decide what node is it going to do. So we kind of distribute we distribute the the decision making to make it uh, a faster faster scheduling, uh, but it does introduce some failure modes that need to be accounted for. So if you go through, you can imagine a workload you deployed a pod into your worker cluster, and that now tried to get scheduled to a cluster that at the same exact time had a job that was scaling up, and it ran out of capacity. And maybe you didn't have a cluster autoscaler set up, or maybe those controls aren't something that you have available to you. Uh, and now that pod can't actually schedule in the new cluster. So those are kind of the, the downfalls of that type of architecture. And then the last thing here, and this is the, the last decision kind of making that, that had to be done is distributing that scheduling decision to many schedulers. So coordinated schedulers talking to each other and deciding and doing uh, resource requests and reservations against those sub uh, schedulers. And, and this is a really, a really interesting architecture uh, because it pretty much reduces the, the chance of any of those race conditions, but uh, it requires a lot of coordination. So the top level scheduler needs to know about every single potential sub scheduler and they need to be doing requests uh, against them while the actual pod is being scheduled, which incurs uh, a significant latency to your actual, uh, to your actual workloads. So enter where we, where we mostly work again, which is virtual cluster, uh, and trying to basically come in at from the multi-tenancy side of things. If you're deploying into a multi-cluster world, you're likely de dealing with a lot of different tenants and trying to make sure that, uh, that all of their workloads get scheduled into somewhere. So problem being multi-tenancy is a legitimate concern when utilizing a large amount of aggregate uh, cluster resources. We have tons of CPU and memory now. We need to aggregate them all together. Uh, and expose those to a subset of users so that they can actually deploy their workloads onto it. And again, since we work with virtual cluster, we kind of started to take a, 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 a lens towards that implementation, which really abstracts out the uh, user control plane as we called it earlier. And we, we refer to it as the tenant control planes in our space. And this is really deploying a, 
uh, Kubernetes API server, controller manager, and etcd, completely off the shelf tools uh, into your cluster and exposing that to uh, the users of your system. So each, each individual tenant, however you want to scope out the architecture, they get access to one of those dedicated control planes. And it kind of, it solves the hard multi-tenancy uh, space by, by isolating customers against that so that you can now really focus on making it so that the super cluster is really good at running workloads and the top level tier uh, gives the flexibility that everybody wants out of Kubernetes. So if somebody wants to deploy a CRD into that cluster, they can do that. Um, and it's not gonna affect the, the lower level workloads. And so that originally started with being scope specific to one super cluster, but it kind of became a natural progression to, well, can we make this run on multiple clusters using that same exact syncing mechanism that we have in place? So as I actually function, it functions by adding another interface in, in, in the middle. Uh, so we talked about the two, two layer scheduling uh, and how that could function. This in essence is building out a top tier scheduler, which operates off of the resources that we already in most multi-tenant environments use today. So things like namespaces and resource quotas. So a top level, uh, a top level scheduler can go through and look at the amount of resources that you're requesting for a specific namespace. And it can start to make those first decisions. So phase one of this is going and doing the, the creation of the namespace and at the same time picking what cluster it should be deployed into based on the amount of quota that you've requested for that single namespace. Um, that can be a very fast decision again, because it's, it's just picking based on capacity and it's not trying to intermingle uh, the amount of uh, the, the pods that are potentially deployed into it or any, uh, any of the other decisions in there. And then once you've picked a cluster for the namespace and the, the, that has capacity to run those workloads, it goes on to the pod creation. So it, it, it in essence uh, goes through and uh, will annotate the pod and the namespace with the cluster name that the workload is supposed to be deployed into, allowing the downstream sinkers to pick up uh, just specifically those workloads and allowing the, the workloads to then get scheduled. Let's look at the architecture of the entire solution for the cost list. Uh, as Chris mentioned before, um, the entire architecture is the extension of the existing virtual cluster uh, architecture. In virtual cluster, we have a sinker, which uh, synchronizes the object between the tenant control plane and the underlying super clusters. As the natural extension, we will see that we will assign, we will, we, we will uh, create a sinker for each worker clusters. And we have a new scheduler, which watch for the worker cluster capacity, change, capacity changes and the uh, object will be creating a tenant control plane. Uh, again, in the VC model, the sinker can watch for multiple tenant clusters. So the same apply for the scheduler as well. Uh, so uh, overall, if you look at the, 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 the new architect uh, is that uh, we, on top of the virtual cluster, we have uh, modified sinkers and then we have a new uh, first level schedulers. Uh, in practice, both the thinker and the scheduler will normally manage by a separate meta clusters, uh, but for simplicity, I'm not going to show that in this, uh, in this figure. Um, all right, next I'm going to talk about some of the implementation details to realize the uh, cluster is uh, prototype. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, for the first thing is we need to uh, enhance the sinker to support selective object synchronization. Uh, the why we want to do that because uh, in theory, you can simplify uh, the solution by just copy all the tenant objects with a namespace in all the underlying worker clusters, but not the pod object, just to prepare the pod will be scheduled to any of the worker clusters. But this will introduce some unnecessary overheads of storing the objects. If the pod is not running those clusters, they are completely waste. So to, re to resolve that problem, we uh, enhancing the sinker to support selective synchronization. And the, uh, the, 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 the decision is, is determined by the placement with us, uh, which, is the, which, is, which is specified by the scheduler. So if you look at the right figure in this example, uh, assuming the namespace A in tenant control plan T1, uh, has the quota and the quota slice config so that they have two slices. And the scheduler uh, has decided the, uh, the, 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 
scheduling decision with the placement results, we put one slice in C1, one slice in C2. Uh, on the other hand, for the namespace B in, ten, in uh, tandem control plan two, uh, it only has one slice and it's scheduled to C1. So the sinker from C1 will synchronize the objects from two namespaces, but the sinker from for C2 will just synchronize the namespace for one namespace, which is the namespace A in T1. Uh, again, so the sinker will synchronize all objects except the path to the underlying worker clusters. And uh, we, we make sure the part will be synced to only one worker clusters, which is the target, which is target uh, clusters uh, determined by the scheduler. Uh, out of all the implementation, the, the most challenging part is to implement a scheduler cache. Unlike the traditional uh, Kubernetes scheduler, you only need to watch for one uh, API server. In this, in this, uh, for this uh, scheduler, it has to watch for the status of multiple uh, clusters, both the in, both tenant control plane and analog worker clusters. There are a lot of failure points uh, in, in, in these settings. For example, the tenant control plane can be offline, uh, one worker cluster can be offline, or one node in one worker cluster can also be offline. So we need to uh, make sure rows, when rows failure happens, the, the, the uh, the scheduler cache is still consistent. We put a lot of efforts to make sure uh, uh, it happens. And another general problem is that uh, whether the scheduler should watch for the, all the node events coming from underlying worker clusters. It can be a huge amount of network traffic if we really want to do that because uh, Kubernetes really generate node harvests and we kind of list, uh, no list API calls. Um, we, to reduce the overhead, we choose to uh, periodically scan the clusters to collect the node status to, uh, and compute the available uh, cluster cap cap capabilities. The downside of doing that is that uh, there, is some, there is a certain delay if the underlying uh, cluster capacity change. We put, the scheduler will be aware of those changes uh, with, with, with some delays, which, which can cause some uh, wrong scheduling decision but we have some uh, remediation pro process can accommodate uh, that effect. In terms of algorithm for the actually scheduling algorithm, it is pretty simplified algorithm implementation as of now. Uh, for namespace quota, quota slice scheduling, we pretty much just do two things. First, we try to choose the minimum amount of clusters can satisfy all the slice uh, requirements. Uh, the reason is that we want to reduce the, the the, the amount of classes that synchronize the uh, non part objects from those namespaces. Uh, and, 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 and we will just use a simple first feed algorithm to pick the, uh, the class, clusters. Uh, for so phase two, part wise scheduling uh, amount of candidate clusters, the algorithm is really simple. We just use a simple first feed uh, or round robin to find the target clusters. Uh, know that there are large room to enhance in the scheduling. Uh, domain. Uh, for example, we can leverage a lot of from the upstream scheduling uh, uh, schedulers, uh, scheduling capabilities such as support affinity and anti-affinity or even spread policy. So uh, with, uh, so if we have that uh, implementation online, we can pretty much support some uh, scenario that we are currently not, that we cannot support for now, let's say for the redundancy of liberty, uh, the, uh, Kind of aspect, uh, but this area is to be enhanced. Uh, although the algorithms are simple, but we still can get some insights from the, the design, such that uh, the namespace uh, quota slice scheduling is not in a part creation critical path, and uh, and our scheduling algorithm makes sure uh, for part scheduling the number of candidate clusters should be small, so this scheduling overhead can be negligible. Overall, by doing this, uh, we can roughly achieve can system-wise port scheduling throughput with uh, with all the unscalability, uh, which is the so potentially you can leverage all the schedulers running inside of the endline uh, worker clusters to schedule all the paths that, that are, are sending to the uh, top level user facing tenant control plane. Uh, I want to talk about some other features, which is very specific to this multi-cluster scheduling. Uh, 
The first one is the rescheduling because uh, the, the, the placed candidate clusters for the namespace can be offline at any time. And uh, unlike the traditional uh, Kubernetes, they have node controller to evict the part in case of node failure. We don't have that controller ready yet for this multi-cluster uh, domain. Uh, instead, for now, we are just allowing people to manually revoke the scheduling decision by removing the uh, scheduling results from the uh, namespace annotation. The schedule we are kicking and reschedule those names namespace uh, to find the uh, online cluster to support those uh, workload. And in case there are some any staging objects stays in the work clusters, the syncer will do the GC. Um, another aspect of in terms of the application workload uh, runtime, it is a service support. Clearly, the native Kubernetes doesn't support a service across clusters. Uh, but if you choose a load ba load balance type of service and point the traffic to a global uh, load balance which support much clusters, I think the entire networking may still work. Uh, another thing is that the, the current architecture should work for other existing multi-cluster networking solutions, uh, such as the CDM cluster mesh. Uh, I think our scheduler, uh, our, our Intel cluster list design support those kind of a solution for the, for the uh, network service cross cluster. Uh, then we have uh, implemented the the features that I mentioned before and come with a prototype. Uh, due to the time limitation, I'm not going to give a full live, uh, live demo, but you can find the demo in this link. Essentially in this demo, what I do is I uh, create one tenant control plan and with two uh, worker clusters. Uh, and I manipulated the quota I specified in the default namespace and the quota slice size so that we have two slices and the scheduler uh, scheduled each one slice in one worker clusters. Then I create a deployment with two uh, replicas called GoLand, and the scheduler will schedule rows uh, paths in two separate worker clusters. And if you look at the screenshot, you can see that from the user phase control plan, you check the, the path, you will see two paths is running. And if you check each two uh, worker cluster named, named the root one and the root two, only one part is running in one worker clusters. Uh, again, for more details, please go to, through this link to see a full demo. So in summary, so the multi-cluster management solution becomes popular and they, they usually choose different uh, workload abstract models and choose different scheduling strategy to, to schedule those workloads. Uh, and the, normally they will bring new APIs. So really integrating those solutions with existing solutions uh, will be, non -tri will be a, a, a non-trivial effort. And uh, for those solution normally requires manual capacity planning, which means the users have to have uh, full knowledge about the, the resource usage of the underlying worker clusters uh, so that they can make sure they are uh, scheduling, th th their scheduling policy can work well, make sure those workloads can still can run in the underlying worker clusters. Uh, on the other hand, in this talk, we propose clusterless. Uh, it is a solution focusing on primarily on the scheduling and multi-tenancy aspects of the multi-cluster uh, management space. Um, we implement the cluster by extending the virtual cluster framework, and we can achieve the scalable scheduling throughput and the entire solution is pretty easy to integrate because we don't introduce any new API to management to manage the workloads. Uh, all right, uh, this is the end of the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.